Asmat Guru Bionamaha, Asmat Parama Guru Bionamaha, Asmat Sarva Guru Bionamaha. So today we're going to continue on with uh, part four of Hari Bhakti Vilas. We are discussing the first Vilas. So let's share that on the screen. So we finished off yesterday, we were talking about um, several different mantras, Vaishnava mantras, including the 12 syllable Om Namo, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya mantra, the eight syllable Om Namo Narayanaya mantra, the 32 syllable Narasimha mantra, Ugram Viram Mahavishnam Jalantam Sarvatomakam, Zimham Bishanam Badram Mityam Mityam Namami Aham. And now we come to a discussion of Rama mantras. So the, here in uh, text 147, it gives uh, a Mahatmyam glories of Rama mantras coming from the Agastya Samhita, which is a book which is very much um, got to do with uh, Lord Rama and Rama's worship. So it says, uh, amongst all mantras, Vaishnava mantras or mantras, that glorify Lord Vishnu are the best. Amongst all mantras, Vaishnava mantras, or mantras that glorify Lord Vishnu, they're the best. So there might be mantras of other devatas, right? But the mantras that glorify Lord Vishnu and Lord Vishnu's avatars, they are the best. These mantras are superior to the mantras related to Ganapati, Shiva, Durga, Surya, etc. And they award the fulfillment of the desires to the devotees who chant them. So continuing on, says amongst all the Vishnu mantras, the Rama mantras award superior results. Sri Rama mantras are millions of times superior to the mantras related to demigods such as Ganapati. O exalted Brahmana, simply by chanting Sri Rama mantras, even without taking initiation, even without having taken initiation or having performed other uh, purificatory uh, rituals, one attains all perfection. So we can look in the Sanskrit here and we can just see in the, in verse uh, 149, it says Vinaiva, which is Vina Eva. Eva means only or also. Vina means without. Diksham, without Diksha. Without Diksha, Rama mantras give all perfection. Without Vinaiva Purascharyam, Purascharyam is the, the, the process of perfecting or getting city or perfection of a mantra. And that process is described in detail in Hari Bhakti Vilas chapter 17. But here it says without that, without the Purascharyam, and then it says Binaiva Nyasa Vidi, Vidina, without doing Nyasa, which we're going to learn about doing Nyasa, touching different parts of the body. Nyasa is a, what we call a Japanga. It is an Anga or a, or a limb or, or a part of doing Japa. When chanting a particular mantra, one should first of all do the nyasa. One should first of all know the nyasa of. We should know the rishi of the of the mantra, the meter of the mantra, the devata of the mantra, uh, and also the purpose of the mantra. And one should touch different parts of the head and uh, to uh, when chanting those different things. That's called mantra nyasa. And there's also other types of nyasa which will also be covered in later on in uh, the fifth vilas of Hari Bhakti Vilas. But here it says, without, without doing that nyasa, normally you should do the nyasa uh, to get the full benefit of the mantra. And then japa mantra and siddhida. So getting, you get the, you can get the perfection of Rama mantras without diksha, without purascharya and without nyasa. So without all these different uh, things that are normally there for mantras. So continuing on to text 150, among eight kinds of Rama mantras, the six syllable Rama mantra awards uh, one the desired results most easily. So here it's said that the six syllable mantra is Om Namo Ramaya. Om Namo Ramaya. This six syllable mantra is the destroyer of all sinful reactions. Now, we can actually look, let's go and look uh, quickly at the at text 150 of the first Vilas and see if in the commentary it actually mentions the mantra. So 150, I don't see any commentary about this. So 
So we don't know so exactly what the six-syllable mantra is. Uh, hello? I would also have the question that when it is mentioned one can attain all perfection yes. without diksha, because it yes. is stressed so much that one has to uh, take diksha from Vaishnava Guru. So yeah, but the thing, this, Prabhupada, yeah. you know, this particular verse is also quoted by Srila Prabhupada. In, in his uh, commentary on Chaitanya Charitamrita, he mentions this, but he doesn't say it is from Rama mantras. In, in, in context, it's given in a, in, a, in a scripture that talks about Rama mantras. But Prabhupada uses this as a proof that chanting the holy name gives all perfection even without initiation. I believe it's in Chaitanya Charitamrita. It's in the Madhya Leela. Uh, it's uh, it, it's a verse 108. I, we can look it up, you know, I, I can find it for you in the purport. Um, unless you want me to pause the recording here and I can uh, look it up. Would you like that? I, I mean, I would just be interested if there is any definition, a particular definition of this perfection. What would this perfection really mean? One attains all perfection. Well, what is the perfection of a, of a Vaishnava mantra? The perfection of a Vaishnava mantra would be to get moksha and to go to Vaikuntha. All, Va, all Vaishnava mantras, the perfection is going to be the eternal service of, of Vishnu, of, of Rama or Krishna or Narasimha. Right? There, there, there are, sometimes it says that mantras will give material perfections as well as spiritual perfections. Like, for instance, the Om Namo Narayana Mantra, Astakshara Mantra. Uh, it's said in scriptures that you get material perfection and you also get spiritual perfections. But, but uh, normally, when we think of these Vaishnava mantras, the purpose of, of chanting them, the purpose of using them is to attain, to attain, uh, to attain moksha, to attain the eternal service of Lord, of Lord Rama or Lord Krishna or Lord Narayana. So that's the perfection. I mean, if it doesn't say exactly what the perfection is, we can assume we are assuming that it's that it means moksha. We can't we can't assume the same thing for demigod mantras because a mantra for Ganapati, if you get perfection of the mantra for Ganapati, you know, you're just simply going to be able to clear obstacles in the way of doing things. But you won't attain moksha because Ganapati can't award you moksha. Right. So we don't know. It doesn't exactly say what what perfection is here, but but uh, but it does say it does. Say, it's an interest. It's very interesting because nowhere else in the scripture do we read statements like this. So without diksha, a mantra can give all perfection, except we do get it a lot in the Gaudiya Sampradaya. We do get about Hari Nam. And after all, the Hari Krishna mantra is also a mantra. So. The idea is that Harinam gives perfection even without initiation. And that's when Prabhupada, Prabhupada quotes this particular verse from, uh, from Hari Bhakti Vilas. When he's saying that Harinam gives all perfection without initiation. So um, did you want me to find that verse? It would just take me a second. No, yeah, if it takes a second, then it's fine. So... Uh, we had this um, this section here in Ch in Hari Bhakti Vilas. It was talking about Rama mantras, and it was said in the in in from the Augusta Samhita that Rama mantras were so powerful that you could chant them even without initiation, and you could attain all perfection. So I mentioned that this was uh, this was actually quoted by Srila Prabhupada in Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhulila fifteen one oh eight. So we're just looking at that now. This, the sloka says, Diksha Purascharya Viri Apeksha Nakare Jihwa Sparshe Achandala Sabare Udare. So the translation is one does not have to undergo initiation or execute the activities required before initiation. One simply has to vibrate the holy name with his lips. Thus, even a man of the lowest class, Achandala, can be delivered. And the purport prophet says, Srila Jiva Goswami explains Diksha in his Bhakti Sandarbha 283. And we're going to have this verse. This verse is, uh, is like a definition of Diksha. It's going to also be there in Hari Bhakti Vilas. Because we're now we're talking about different mantras that the Guru 
in Hari Bhakti Vilas can can give in Diksha to the disciple. So the um, the definition of Diksha, the word Diksha is made up of two parts, D and Cha. So it says the D is Divya Gyanam Yato Dadyat Kuryat Papa Shasankshayam Tasma Dikshati Saprok Dadeshika Istat Vidaihi. Diksha is the process by which one can awaken his transcendental knowledge and vanquish all reactions caused by sinful activity. A person expert in the study of the revealed scriptures knows this as the process of diksha. The regulative principles of diksha are explained in Hari Bhakti Vilas 2, 3, and 4, um, chapter uh, Vilas 2, verses 3 and 4, and Bhakti Sindhama 283. As stated, Divya Gyanam Anupetanam Svakarma Dhyana Dishu. Yata di karo na sita stiha na stiha svach chopanayanad anu tatatra dikshitanam tu mantra devarchanadishu nadi karo stiata kuryad atmanam shiva samstutam. Even though born in the bra in the in a in a Brahmana family, one cannot engage in Vedic rituals without being initiated and having a sacred thread. Although born in a Brahmin family, one becomes a Brahmana only after initiation and the sacred thread ceremony. Unless one is initiated as a Brahmana, one cannot worship the holy name properly. According to the Vaishnava regulative principles, one must in be initiated as a Brahmana. Hari Bhakti Vilas, Vilas 2, chapter uh, Verse 6 quotes the following injunction from the Vishnu Yamala. Adikshitasya vam vamoru kritam sarvam niratakam pasu yonim avapnoti diksha virahito janaha. Unless one is initiated by a bona fide spiritual master, all his devotional activities are useless. A person who's not initiated can descend again into the animal species. So this is the what this is explaining from Vishnu Yamala exactly what initiation is going to save you from. It's going to save you from regressing. Otherwise, if you don't get initiated, there's a possibility of regressing in your next life and going back to being in uh, in an animal life or an animal species. Hari Bhakti Vilas, Vilas two, verse ten further quotes, Ato Gurum. Pranam yaiva sarvasvam vinivedyacha vriniyad vaishnavam vaishnava mantram diksha purvam vidanataha. It's the duty of every human being to surrender to a bona fide spiritual master, giving him everything, body, mind, and intelligence. One must take Vaishnava initiation from him. So then later on, it says here the Bhakti Sandarbha 298 gives the following quotation from a book called Tattva Sagara. Yata kanchanatam yati, yati, kanchyam rasa vidanataha, tata diksha vidhanena dvijatvam jayate nrinam. By the chemical man manipulation, bell metal can be turned into gold when it is touched by mercury. Uh, similarly, when a person is properly initiated, he acquires the qualities of a Brahmana. The Hari Bhakti Vilas, 17th Vilas, uh, verses 11 to 12, is the, in discussing the Purusharya process, quotes the following verses from the Augusta Samhita. Right? So this is the same, the same book that we are looking at the quote in Hari Bhakti Vilas in the first Vilas in uh, verses uh, 147 to 149, I, I believe. We were lo just looking. It also quotes from the Augustus Samhita, which is a book which mostly speaks about Rama worship. So here, there's another couple of verses which are quoted in the later part of Hari Bhakti Vilas, in, in Vilas 17. And Vilas 17 is about Purusharya. It's about Purusharana or Purusharya. They're the same thing. It means when you get a mantra from, from, a, from the teacher, then you practice the mantra in a certain way with certain rituals by doing homa, by doing japa, by doing tarpana, by doing different rituals with the mantra. 
and also by feeding Brahmins and, and Vaishnavas. And, uh, and by doing that, you will, you will get the perfection of the mantra. You will attain the city of the mantra. So this is called Purusharya, right? So remember that this, this verse in Chaitanya Charam is saying you don't have to get Diksha and you don't have to do Purusharya to attain the perfection of the holy name, chanting the holy name. So here, these verses are Puja, Traika Liki, Nityam, Japas, Tarpana, Tarpana Mevacha, Homo, Brahmana Bhuntis Cha, Purusharana Muchite. So this is a definition of what is called Purusharana. It talks about uh, doing Japa, doing Tarpana, doing Homa or fire ritual and freeding. Brahmana Bhuntas, Bhuntas means this means um, feeding Brahmins. Guru lab, labdasya mantrasya prasadena yatavidi pancho panchangopasana siddhyai puras chaitad vidhiyate. In the morning, afternoon, and evening, one should worship the deity using the mantra, right? That's the idea. Chant the Hare Krishna mantra, offer oblations in the fire. Right, so there should be japa of the mantra, worship of the deity with the mantra, japa of the mantra, offering oblations into the sacred fire with the mantra, perform a fire sacrifice and feed brahmanas. And they also, oh, so offering oblations here means, is means tarpana, means offering water with the mantra through the hand. These five activities constitute purascharya to attain full success when taking initiation from the spiritual master, one should first perform the purascharya processes. So as soon, right after initiation into a mantra, you're supposed to do the Purascharya rituals and you're supposed to try to attain perfection of the, of the mantra. And different mantras involve different amounts of Purascharya or types of Purascharya. And the normal system is the japa of the mantra has, has to be 100,000 times the number of syllables in the mantra. That's normally what they, what, what, uh, what they s suggest in Purascharya. But for instance, with certain mantras, you have to chant them more or less. For instance, in Kali Shantaranya Upanishad, the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, or some people call the Hare Rama Maha Mantra, depending on which, which, uh, which holy name comes first. In that, it says you should chant 35 million times, three and a half koti. Koti is 10 million or, or a crore in, in Indian parlance, and 10 million. So three and a half times 10 million is 35 million times. So 35 million times chanting that mantra of 32 syllables is the, is the amount that you're supposed to do for the Purascharya, right? And that's stated in Kali Shantaran Upanishad. Anyway, so the, but normally the normal, the general rule is 100,000 times per syllable. So if, if you get, if somebody initiated you into the Omkara, which is just one syllable, then you have to chant it 100,000 times. Then there's then we'll see in when we read Hari Bhakti Vilas um, Vilas 17 we'll see that you do japa a certain number of times and then you do homa one tenth of that time and tarpana one tenth of that time. There are different there are different numbers for the different uh, other rituals that you perform with the mantra. Anyway, to continue on, the word puraha means before and charya means activities. Due to the necessity of these activities, we do not immediately initiate disciples in the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. For six months, so what's, what Prabhupada seems to be saying here is he, he's equating Purusharya with the, with the six months that people spend chanting the Hare Krishna mantra before he gives them formal Hare Nam initiation. But in actual fact, if we, we, if we read the if we read the uh, 17th Vilas of Hari Bhakti Vilas, we'll find that Pura's Charya actually comes after initiation because you can't chant the mantra before you're initiated into it. However, that's the point. That's the whole point of this sloka in Chaitanya Charamita is that you can chant the Hare Krishna mantra and you can get benefit from it even before you're initiated. Whereas there are some other mantras which you should be initiated first before you, before you can chant them and attain get any benefit from them. So anyway, uh, due to the necessity of these activities, we do not immediately initiate disciples in the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. For six months, a candidate for initiation must first attend RT, 
<coughs> and classes in the Shastras <coughs> practice the regular principles and associate with other devotees. When one is actually advanced in the Purusharya Vidhi, he is recommended by the local temple president for initiation. It is not that anyone can suddenly be initiated without meeting the requirements. When one is further advanced by chanting the Hare Krishna mantra 16 rounds daily, following the regular principles and attending classes, he receives a sacred thread or Brahminical recognition after the second six months. Okay, so Prabhupada's just outlining the system that in ISKCON for taking first initiation or Harinam initiation and the second initiation, which is Upanayanam or the Brahminical initiation, which also includes Vaishnava mantras which we're going to discuss. This is the Vaishnava Diksha, which is discussed in the second Vilas of Hari Bhakti Vilas, which is coming up. So continuing on, it says in Hari Bhakti Vilas 17, 4, 5, verses 4 and 5 and 7, it says, Vina yena nesidhisyan mantro varsha shateer api kritena yena labate sadako vanchitam palam purascharya sampano mantro hi pala Dayakaha Ata Puras Kriyam Kuryat Mantravit Siddhi Kankshaya Puras Kriya Hi Mantranam Pradanam Viryam Uchyate Virya Hi No Yata De Hi Sarvakama Sukhna Shamaha Puras Charana Hi No Hi Na Mantraha Prakirtitaha. So that's translated as without performing the Purusharya activities, one cannot become perfect even by chanting his mantra for hundreds of years. But one who has undergone the Purusharya Vidhi process can attain success very easily. If one wishes to perfect his initiation, he must first undergo the Purusharya activities. The Purusharya process is the life force by which one is successful in chanting the mantra. Without the life force, one cannot do anything. Similarly, without the life force of Purusharya Vidhi, no mantra can be perfected. So later in, in uh, then he says in Bhakti Sandarbha 283 to 284, which again, uh, Bhakti Sandarbha 283 was giving the definition of Diksha, Srila Jiva Goswami describes the importance of deity worship and initiation, Diksha, as follows. So I'm not going to read the Sanskrit, but the translation is, it is, in, it, it is Srimad Bhagavatam's opinion that the process of deity worship is not actually necessary, just as the specific prescriptions of the Pancharatra and other scriptures do not have to be followed. Right? The Bhagavatam enjoins that even without practicing deity worship, one can achieve the complete success of human life by, uh, by other devotional processes, such as simply offering oneself at the lotus feet, at the Lord's feet for his protection, which is Atmani Vedanam, or in Navada Bhakti, that's called Atmani Vedanam, uh, surrendering one's soul to the Lord. And it's also called property and, uh, or Sharanagati. Uh, so nonetheless, Vaishnavas follow the path of Sri Narada and his successors in, uh, following the path of Sri Narada and his successors, endeavor to establish a personal relationship with the Lord by receiving the grace of a bona fide spiritual master through initiation. And in this tradition, the, the devotees are obliged at the time of initiation to begin engaging in deity worship, which is what is said in Hari Bhakti Vilas immediately after the initiation ceremony, the initiation, the Vilas 2 on initiation. Then it says in Vilas 3, in the beginning Vilas 3, it says, okay, now you're initiated. Now you have this mantra. Now you have to use it. And the way you use it is, is different ways. You can meditate on the meaning of the mantra. You can do japa of the mantra. You can use it in different rituals. You can use it in fire ceremony. You can use it to worship the deity. And that's a very important use of it is to worship the deity, the mantras that we get in initiation. If we don't use the mantra that we're given in initiation, then it's, it, it's a waste. It's considered in Hari Bhakti Lhasa, it's that you've wasted the initiation because you haven't used it to worship the deity. So here it says, right here it says, it says, similarly, 
the Ram Archana Chandrika, now in Harivakti Vilas, this quote, this quote is coming, uh, is said to come from Augustus Samhita. So there's another book called Ram Archana Chandrika, which also quotes from Augustus Samhita. So the original, the original source of this is the Augustus Samhita. So it's the same verse uh, as, I, as we were just discussing in Harivakti Vilas. Vinaya Vadiksham, Vipendra Purusharyam, Vinaya Vahi, Vinaya Vanyasa, Vidina, Japa Matrena, Siddhi Da. You will get the city of the mantra, even without initiation into it, even without Purusharya, even without doing Nyasa. So, best of the Brahmanas, even without initiation, preliminary purification or acceptance of the renounced order. I think Prabhupada has translated Nyasa here as Sanyasa. Okay, so sannyasa is a type of nyasa. Nyasa means nyasa, the word nyasa means placing. It means, in this sense, it means placing yourself at the feet of the Lord or surrender to the Lord, Sharanagati or property. So it can mean total surrender, but it also can mean sannyasa should also be total surrender. Sannyasa means total surrender, giving up all material um, lifestyle and renouncing all material life. Okay, so. It's synonymous. I mean, there are two different. Um, uh, uh, so, Prabhupada here is translating it as accepting the renounced order. One can, one can attain perfection in devotional service simply by chanting the Lord's holy name. Simply by chanting the whole Lord's holy name. So that's the point. So let's we continue on. Why don't we read the whole purport here? In other words, the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is so powerful it does not depend on official initiation. But if one is initiated and engages in Pancharatrika Vidhi, deity worship, his Krishna consciousness will awaken very soon. So that was the point being made that still, even, even, if, the, even if chanting of Rama Mantra or chanting of Hare Krishna Maha Mantra um, gives us some, it doesn't, we don't need to, to get initiated before doing it and we do it and we still get some, some some benefit from doing it still if we get initiated and we perform deity worship, then the benefit will be will come quicker and, and will come there will more benefit will come and it will awaken our Krishna consciousness very soon is what Prabhupada says. In the identification of the material world and his identification with the material world will be vanquished. So we'll give up this uh, thinking that the body is the soul, um, this missent, um, this mire of uh, illusion. The more uh, the more one is freed from material identification, the more one can realize that the spirit soul is qualitatively but not quantitatively, qualitatively, as good as the Supreme Soul. As at such a time, when one is situated on the absolute platform, one can understand that the holy name of the Lord and the Lord himself are identical. At that stage of realization, the holy name of the Lord, the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, cannot be identified with any material sound. If one accepts the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra as a material vibration, he falls down. One should worship and chant the holy name of the Lord by accepting it as the Lord himself. One should therefore be initiated properly according to the revealed scriptures under the direction of a bona fide spiritual master. So you see that the, the actual sloka here in, Chait in Chaitanya Charamrita is saying that you don't need to be initiated. You don't need to be Purusharana or Nyasa. But Prabhupada is taking this advan advantage of this sloka to preach that Although you don't actually need to be initiated to chant the Hare Krishna mantra and achieve perfection, right? Still, it's important that you actually do take initiation, even though it's not necessary. The, the Hare Krishna mantra is so powerful. So, uh, although chanting the holy name is good for both the conditioned and liberated soul, it is especially benefited, beneficial to the conditioned soul because by chanting it, one is liberated. When a person who chants the holy name is liberated, he attains the ultimate perfection by returning home back to Godhead. In the words of Chaitanya Charamrita Adi Lila 773, Krishna Mantra Haite Habe, Samsara Mochana, Krishna Nama Haite Habe, Krishnera Charana. Simply by chanting the holy name of Krishna, one can obtain freedom from material existence. Indeed, simply by chanting the Hare Krishna Mantra, one will be able to see the lotus feet of the Lord. The offenseless chanting of the holy name does not depend on the initiation process. So that's important, Prabhupada saying. You don't need to be initiated and you can still chant the holy name offenselessly, which means perfectly. 
right. Uh, so, although initiation may depend upon, although initiation may depend on Purushchari or Purushchari, the actual chanting of the holy name does not depend upon Purushchari Vidhi or the regular principles. Hmm. So I'm not quite sure what he's getting at there. He's because he equated the Purushcharya as a preliminary six months of chanting Hare Krishna before taking the first initiation or the Hari Nam initiation, and then another further six months of following all the rules until getting uh, uh, Upanayana or Vaishnava Diksha. Um, during the chanting, the holy name, the, t the tongue must work. Simply by chanting the holy name, one is immediately delivered. The tongue is Sevon Mukha Jihwa. The word Jihwa means tongue. Uh, it is controlled by service. Sevon Mukha Jihwa. Controlled by service. One whose tongue is engaged in tasting material things and also talking about them cannot use the tongue for absolute realization. Atashi Krishna Namadi Nabavid Grahamindriyehi. Sevan Mukhi Hijiva Dao Swayam Eva Sparatya Daha. That's Chaitanya Janarita Madhya 17, verse 136. With the material senses, one cannot understand the transcendental holy name of the Lord or his form, activities, pastimes, and pastimes. But when one actually engages in devotional service, utilizing the tongue, the Lord is revealed. As is said in Chaitanya Charanita, Madhya 17, 134. Ataeva Krishnera Nama Deha Vilasa Prakritendriya Grahya Nahe Haya Swa Prakasha. The holy name of Krishna, his body, his pastimes cannot be understood by the blunt material senses. They are manifested independently. So if we go back to uh, Hari Bhakti Vilas and it seems, it seems pretty, uh, Prabhupada also doesn't say in that purport, he doesn't speak about what the perfection is that one would, would, would get by chanting a mantra without, but he specifically is talking about the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra there, the, the Lord's holy names. We should also note that the, the name Rama in, and the six syllable Rama Mantra, which is specifically being talked about in Hari Bhakti Vilas here, is also a name of the Lord and therefore the, the city of that mantra is the same as the city of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, the same as the city of all the other Vishnu mantras that we've learned about so far, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudeva, Om Namo Narayanaya, Narasimha, Anastub Mantra. So all of these Vishnu mantras, the city is to attain moksha, which means eternal service to the Lord in Vaikuntha, Lord Narayana in Vaikuntha. Okay, so... Or, you know, as or Lord Krishna and Goloka Vrindavan, if you want to uh, think of it like that. So if we look at uh, Hari Bhakti Vilas again, uh, this is the, that was just, uh, that was just, does that, does that answer the question as to what the, I mean, Prabhupada also didn't say what the perfection of chanting Hare Krishna was in that purport, but we know from other, from reading other things that the perf perfection of chanting Hare Krishna offenselessly is that one will go to Goloka Vrindavan and serve Radha Krishna and Goloka Vrindavan. That's the perfection of that. Krishna Prema. Right? So uh, we, should, we should also think that somebody who wants to worship Lord Ramachandra, he, which is the specific mantra here is Ram Mantra, he can chant the, the six-syllable Rama Mantra without initiation, and he can attain all perfection. With the caveat that, of course, if he, he should take initiation, that's good. If he does take initiation, and if he does perform nyasa, and if he does perform purusacharya, that's also good, because those things are given in by the Lord in the scriptures. So, so we should do all those things. We can do all those things, but we don't need to do all those things, which is what the purpose of this verse, the verse um, 149 here, is explaining that without diksha it also works. Okay, without diction, without Purushanya, without Nyasa. Yeah, I'm just thinking also about this aspect of offenses that you mentioned. And um, of course, without instructions, particular instructions, it would be hard to avoid offenses and then really to achieve fast success. It would be also one. Okay, perhaps. if we remember in the Bhagavatam in the sixth canto, 
Sankhetyam parihasyam va stoba mahelam eva va vaikuntanam grahanam ashesha grahanam vidu. It's the most important verse in the sixth canto. It's the definition of nama bas. There are three, according to in Gaudi Vaishnavism, we talk about three types of chanting. There's offensive chanting, right? Offensive chanting means that you that you're you're performing one of the ten offenses, or even there are other offenses in deity worship that you might be doing. There are different offenses. If you want to read uh, extensively about the offenses, you should read a book called Hari Nam Chintamani by Bhakti Vinod Thakur. One chat, it's a, it's, a, it's a conversation between Lord Chaitanya and Hari Das Thakur, who is the Namacharya. And one chapter about each offense, how to recognize it, how to, how to not commit it, right? And how to get over it, right? It, it, one chapter on each, and then a chapter on uh, offenses in deity worship, how they affect the chanting of the holy name. So then after that, it, uh, higher things are explained. But in the Bhagavatam itself, it, it gives this definition of Nama Bas, which is the middle, uh, the middle standard of chanting. There's offensive chanting. Once we, once we don't commit any offenses, right? We exactly, don't exactly have pure love of God. And we're not chanting purely um, pure love of God. It's not the topmost form of chanting but at least we're not committing any offenses. It's sort of a neutral stage that is called Nama Bas, which literally means like a shadow of the name, uh, not exactly the name, like the name. So Nama Bas is what Ajamil did when, he's, when he chanted, he yelled out the name of his son when he was dying. His son's name was Narayana. And he yelled out, Narayana, Narayana, please come here. And uh, he wanted his son to come uh, be with him when he was passing away. But uh, being the name of the Lord also, it was chanting, but there were no offenses because he, he wasn't committing any offense when he chanted it. So that verse, Sanket Yam Parihasimba says, even if you're counting or joking or sing, singing a song or somehow or other, if you chant the holy name of the Lord without offense, you're not necessarily, not necessarily chanting it totally purely or in love of God, but you're not making any offense, you will attain all perfection. Right, so that's that's the purport of that verse. So, uh, yeah, I agree with you that that one has to avoid offenses, but that's the whole idea. The whole idea of performing the Purusharya is to is to get city of the mantra, is to get city of the mantra. So, by following the rules and regulations of the Purusharya Vidhi, then uh, and doing the nyasa and doing everything you can to avoid the offenses. Right, then you'll come to the perfection of the mantra. But but here it says, once again, once again, the whole the whole point of this sloka is without diksha, without purascharya, and without nyasa. It says very clearly, Vinaiva Diksha, Vinaiva Purisharya, Vinaiva Nyasa. Without all those things, the Rama mantras, Siddhida. Japa, japa mantrena siddhida. By chanting this mantra, you can get you can you can get all perfection. And it's the same thing with the Hare Krishna mantra too, right? That's what Prabhupada's trying to say that even without these things, you can attain perfection. Now, should we should we therefore forget about initiation, forget about purusharya, forget about nyasa? No, we should still do those things, as you said because the Lord commands those things to be done in the scriptures. So we should do those things. But even if we, even if somebody doesn't do those things, still they can attain all perfection. That's what it says. Okay. So anyway, it's just very, uh, it's just what, very what interesting. This, because, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, the mantra is coming. This this six syllable Rama mantra is coming. I saw it in the next text. Yeah. Among all among eight kinds of Rama mantras, the six syllable Rama mantra awards all the desired results most easily. So there might be even amongst the Rama mantras which don't require initiation, this particular mantra is being um, said here as to be a most most easy to use. So we're gonna. There's gonna be some some discussion of which mantra is mo is easy for which person, coming up in Hari Bhakti Ulas. It's gonna explain that. So there are some tests that the guru can do, to see whether a person can 
whether he should initiate what person into a particular mantra or into a different mantra. So this Om Namo, Naraya, Om Namo Ramaya, is this Om Namo Ramaya, six syllables. Uh, mantra is the destroyer of all sinful reactions. So this is just talking about, we've talked about Vishnu mantras and Narasim mantras. Now, now we're talking about Rama mantras. So continuing on, texts 151 and 152, this is all still coming from Augustus Samhita. And it says, because the six syllable Rama mantra is the best of all Rama mantras, it has been described as the king of mantras. So we know some other mantras, even the Narasimha understood mantra is called Mantra Raja, the king of all mantras. One who chants, you have to be also, you have to be uh, cognitive of the idea here that in scriptures, in Hari Bhakti Las, there's going to be a lot of Mahatmyams. There's going to be the glories of this and the glories of that. So whenever something is glorified, it's glorified to the ultimate degree. It's glorified to the maximum. So people, some people may say, well, the, when we read about the Narasimha mantra, that was supposed to be the greatest. When we read about the Narayana mantra, that's supposed to be the greatest. When we read about the Vasudeva mantra, that's supposed to be the greatest. Now they're saying the Rama mantra is the greatest. They're all the greatest. They're all the greatest. They're, normally we think of one being greater than the other, but everything is, everything is, is uh, glorified in, in superlative terms. So don't worry about that. That's just the, that's just the nature of Sanskrit and Sanskrit. Everything which you want to glorify can be put in the superlative. Everything which you want to say is bad, you can make it the worst like that. So you, you, you just have to um, understand that the idea of saying something is the best isn't necessarily mean that it's better than something else, which is also the best, but it's just saying that it's very, very great. It's great. It's, it's so great. And we want, to, we want to impress upon you how great it is. So we say it's the best. Because this six-syllable six Rama mantra is the best of all Ram, mantras, Rama mantras, it has been described as the king of mantras. One who chants this mantra is quickly freed from all reactions of sins that are committed daily, fortnightly, monthly, seasonally, and yearly, just as fire quickly burns a mountain of cotton to ashes. Sins committed by killing innumerable Brahmanas. Sins, sins committed knowingly and unknowingly. Right, so that's interesting because normally we find about many, many times they say sins which are unknowingly committed are destroyed, but even knowingly, even you purposefully and knowingly do a sin, right? They are, those sins are destroyed. Sins of stealing, drinking wine and having an intimate relationship with the wife of the spiritual master, as well as thousands of other sins are destroyed by constantly chanting this Rama mantra, Om Namo Ramai, the six syllable one. So continuing on, we're going to talk uh, about now about uh, there's a quotation coming from the Shruti from the Upanishads. A lot of times when, when uh, pramanas are given from different Shastras, we like to take, uh, uh, we like to take Shastric pramanas from the Vedas, from the actual Upanishads, right? So those will be considered more important. Um, and for Gaudiya Vaishnavas also from Shruna Bhagavatam also is considered very, very important proof of, of different points. So in the Ram Tapani Upanishad, it's stated, a Brahman, a Brahmana who every day chants this Rama mantra, which is the supreme deliverer of all living beings, becomes freed from all sinful reactions. He thus conquers the cycle of repeated birth and death. He becomes freed from all sinful reactions, even the killing of an embryo. So even, even abortion, even the sin of abortion, he gets, he gets cured from that. He uh, becomes freed from material existence. He is relieved of all types of contamination. He attains the association of devotees and ultimately achieves liberation. So I think that answers the question that somebody might have had before about what, what is the perfection achieved by chanting the Rama Mantra? Well, here's the perfection. Here's the perfection ex ex explained. He gets rid of all these sinful activities, all these sinful reactions, and he gets freed from material existence. So now we're going to continue on and we're going to leave Rama mantras. So we've uh, talked about Vasudev mantra, Vishnu mantra, Narayana mantra, Rama mantra. And now we're going to talk about Krishna mantras, Gopal Dev mantra. So the glories of the Gopal Dev mantra. So this is uh, Mahatmyam or the glories of the mantra to Sri Krishna. The mantra 
of Sri Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead and the fountainhead of all incarnations is more powerful than the mantras of his incarnations, right? So, of course, according to Guru Vaishnava Siddhanta, Krishna Stu Bhagavan Swayam in, ba in Brahma Samhita says, Krishna is Sarva Karana Karnam. He's the cause of all causes. So all other forms of Vishnu, all forms of Narasimha, all forms of Rama, all these other forms are considered to be incarnations of the original form of Krishna in Goloka Vrindavan. So what, 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 what Gopabhada Goswami and Sanan Goswami are saying here is they're saying that therefore the mantras of Krishna are more powerful. And just remember, we talked about um, hyperbole here. So everything, every time we introduce a new, a new thing, we're going to say it's the greatest thing. We're going to say it's, the, but at the same time, uh, according to Gaudiya Vaishnavism, we have to accept that these, these mantras are the most powerful mantras, more powerful than the mantras for Vishnu and Rama or Narasimha or whatever. So uh, text 156, we're going to give from the section of the Gautamiya Tantra. The Gautamiya Tantra is very much got to do with Lord Krishna. So there's a uh, Govinda Vrindavan section in Gautamiya Tantra. And it says, amongst all mantras, Vishnu mantras are the best. And the especially powerful Krishna mantras can award the chanter all kinds of enjoyment as well as liberation are superior to the Vishnu mantras. Okay, so we just heard about other Vishnu mantras, and now we're hearing about the Krishna mantras. And again, he's giving this pramana from Gautamiya Tantra that, ex that uh, explains how the Krishna mantras are more, they are the best of Vishnu mantras. So remember, in, when, we're, when we're discussing just before from uh, Augustus Samhita, it said, of all these, uh, of all mantras, there might be mantras to different demigods like Ganapati and Surya and Devi. Millions of times greater are the Brahma mantras. And now it's saying that the Krishna mantras are even greater than that. So if we continue on, text 157, 158. Although each mantra has a predominating deity because Sri Krishna is the origin of all incarnations and has a form that is described as Sat Chit Ananda Vigraha. He is the object of all mantras and the supreme worshipable Lord of all. Simply by remembering him, the devotee attains all kinds of enjoyment and, uh, and, uh, and ultimate liberation. Text 159. Because Sri Krishna unlimitedly manifested his supremacy in his pastimes as a cowherd boy in Vrindavan, Mantras in relation to him are the best of all. The 18 syllable mantra is the best of all mantras in relation to Sri Krishna. Okay, so now um, this is also continuing on from Gautamiya Tantra. It's saying that not only are Vishnu mantras greater than any other Devata mantras, any mantras to any other demigods, not only that, but Krishna mantras are the best out of the Vishnu mantras. The Vishnu mantras are the best out of all mantras. But the be better than that, the Krishna mantras are better than the Vishnu mantras. And out of all the Krishna mantras, which are the best mantras, the best Krishna mantra of all is the 18 syllable mantra. The Gopal mantra. Okay. So now we're going to get a specific, now that we've introduced that, after, after we've got the pramanas from different shastras saying that Krishna mantras are better than all other Vishnu mantras, right? Now, specifically, um, um, pointing to the Gopal mantra, the 18 syllable Gopal mantra, and explaining the glories of it. So the next verse is going to give us the glories of the 18 syllable mantra. And this is also quoted from Gopal Tapani Upanishad. Gopal Tapani Upanishad, again, an Upanishad, Shruti. So this is, what, this is what happens when we hear about different mantras. Some mantras are coming from Agama, some are coming from Puranas, some are coming from different places. But when we hear of a mantra coming in the Shruti, in the Upanishads, that mantra is considered to be very, very powerful and very important. So similarly, we have the Narasimha Mantra coming in, Narasimha Tapani Upanishad. We have the Rama Mantra coming in, Ram Tapani Upanishad. We have the Gopal Mantra coming in, Gopal Tapani Upanishad. We have the Narayana Astakshara Mantra coming in, uh, Narayana Upanishad. 
Atavashira Upanishad. We have we have the Hare Krishna mantra coming in Kalishantara and Upanishad. All of these are Upanishadic mantras. They're coming in the Upanishads, they're Shruti. So they're considered by everybody to be very powerful. So especially here, this Gopal Tapani Upanishad is quoted on the Gopal mantra, and it says, Once great sages headed by Sanaka asked Brahma, O oh Lord, who is the greatest of all? Who is the person that death personified is afraid of? Who is the person who by knowing there is nothing left to be known? In reply, Brahma said, Lord Krishna is the Supreme Brahman. He is the Supreme Personality of God and he is eternal, full of knowledge and full of bliss. He is the worshipable Lord of all. Even death personified is afraid of Sri Govinda. Simply by obtaining knowledge of the characteristics of Lord Gopi Janavalaba, everything becomes known. This material existence is under the control of his external energy, Maya. The sages ask Brahma, who is Krishna? Who is Govinda? Who is Gopi Janavalaba? Okay, so now what's happening here is if we look up in the in the Sanskrit, if we look up in the Sanskrit, we'll see that the words the, the, the different names, Krishna is known by these different names. Krishna, right? Govinda, and Gopijana Vallabha, right? And even the word Swaha is used here in the Sanskrit. So what happens many times in the Agamas and in, even in the Vedas, in the Upanishads, right? That when we're reading, the exact mantra isn't given fully uh, word by word. But what they do is they give the words one at a time in different parts of the of the uh, of the of the Sanskrit. And if you if you have a guru who understands the internal meaning of the shastra, he's able to extract the mantra from this. So when I, if I look at this, if I know this mantra is Klim Krishna Govinda Gopijana Vallabhai Swaha, I can look in here and I can see Krishna, I can see Govinda, I can see Gopijana Vallabha, I can see Swaha. Understand? So I can see the mantra in this Sanskrit because I know what the mantra is. But a person who maybe doesn't know what the mantra is yet, who hasn't taken initiation or hasn't heard from the guru, the, the guru is going to explain to him the Shastra that gives the mantra and is explaining in, in the Shastra where to find the mantra. So this is sometimes there. Sometimes, for instance, we have um, there's a guy, to, for instance, the Ramayana. If we look in the Ramayana, the Ramayana is 24,000 verses long, right? So the first syllable, that, so it's also called, it's also considered to be equal to the Gayatri Mantra, which has 24 syllables. So the Gayatri Mantra has three, eight, three times eight, 24 syllables, right? So the Ramayana has 24,000 verses. So the first syllable of each thousandth verse in the Ramayana, if you take those out of the Ramayana and put them together, you get the Gayatri Mantra. So that's amazing. Similarly, they have, they have, uh, there are other slokas, sometimes stotras and, and verses that you can read where this, the syllables of a mantra are given, but they're not given together. They're given spread out in the, in the, in the mantra. So only a person who's a guru who's understood the esoteric meaning of that scripture can pull out the mantras out of there and give them to the disciple. So these are some, these are, these books that ex they explain these things are the teachings of the esoteric teachings of mantras. These are called Rahasya Granthas or secret esoteric meanings. So here, for instance, in Gopal Tapani Upanishad, the esoteric meaning of this, this, these, uh, so, this, these slokas here is the Gopal Mantra. And you can see the Gopal Mantra in it if you know what the Gopal Mantra is. But if you don't know, you won't be able to find it. So it's, uh, this is how secret, some secret teachings are handed down in the Agamas and the, and the Vedas. Okay, so continuing on. Brahma replied, the most worshipable Lord Krishna is he who forgives the offenses of even the demons. The name Govinda means the Lord of the cows of Vrindavan, the Lord of the earth, and the Lord of everything that is described in the Vedas. Gopi Janavalaba refers to he who inspires the gopis to participate in his transcendental pastimes. And the word swaha refers to the energy, energy of the Lord. There is no difference between the energy and the energetic. One who meditates upon the Lord and becomes jubilant upon seeing his form and who worships him 
as the predominating deity of this mantra certainly attains immortality. The sages said, O oh Lord, what does he look like? What should one do to please him? What is the method for worshiping him? We wish to know all of this, and so kindly describe it to us in detail. Brahma replied to the sages, headed by Sanaka, these four sages, the, the four Kumaras. O oh, sages, his form is like, is like that of a cowherd boy. His complexion is like that of a newly formed monsoon cloud. He is ever, ever youthful and he is like a desire, desire tree and he resides under a desire tree. So he himself is like a desire tree and, he's, and he is under a desire tree. A desire tree uh, is a tree and the idea of that tree is that tree is wish fulfilling tree. That tree can fulfill wishes. Similarly, there was a cow also called Kamadena which could fulfill desires. So there are these uh, entities of tree, uh, Kamadenu, uh, Kamadenu is a desire cow and uh, Kalpaviksha is a desire tree. Okay, so continuing on in the same Upanishad, there are some more statements. The process for worshiping the Lord is to render devotional service unto him and the supreme form of worship is to concentrate one's mind on Krishna while giving up all desires for sense gratification. Those sages who are conversant with Vedic knowledge worship Krishna in various moods, various moods, right? So this is why we talk about different rasas with Krishna, that the living being will have different moods and different rasas with Krishna, beginning with Shanta or, or peacefulness, right? Uh, <clears throat> there are, uh, they worship Govinda with nine types of devotional service. Okay, this, that's, uh, that's an allusion to Navada Bhakti. Sravanam Kirtanam Vishnu Smaranam Parasevanam Archanam Bandhanam Dasim Sakramat Vedanam, which was propounded in the Bhagavatam by Prahlad Maharaj or in the, by Lord Rama in the Ramayana, there's also a mention of Navada Bhakti, which is slightly different. The Supreme Lord, the, the same Govinda appears as Gopijana Vallabha and sustains the universes. The Supreme Lord creates the universe through the agency of his external energy. And continuing on in the Gopal Tapani Upanishad with verse 162, the one Supreme Lord Sri Krishna is manifested in the five word Gopal Mantra. Five word Gopal Mantra. So, Slim, Krishnaya, Govindaya, Gopijana Vallabhaya. Swaha, five, five words. <clears throat> As the original air enters the universe and then becomes divided into five prana, prana vayu, apana vayu, samana vayu, udana vayu, and vyana vayu. So prana, apana, vyana, udana, samana, right? So Krishna has revealed himself in five features for the benefit of all. So these five words also represent these five features of Krishna. We continue on. <clears throat> After explaining how to worship the Lord, the following verse is found. So not exactly sure where this verse is from, but anyway, Lord Krishna, maybe also from, Kali, uh, from uh, uh, Gopal Tapani Upanishad, I'm not sure, we have to look it up. Lord Krishna is the super soul of all living entities. He is all pervading one without a second, an absolute. No one is equal to or greater than him. Everything within the material world and in the spiritual world is fully under his control. He is unlimited. He is not under the jurisdiction of material time and space. Because he is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he is worshipable for all. Although he is one, he manifests as five out of his inconceivable potency. Those unalloyed devotees who worship the Supreme Lord, who manifest as the five word mantra, obtain eternal happiness. So here we have uh, another verse here. Nityo nityo nam chaitanas chaitanana meka. But this is, seems to also be from the Upanishads. Uh, the Supreme Personality of God, it is the maintainer of innumerable living entities in terms of their different situations according to the individual, to individual work and reactions of work. That Supreme Personality of God, it is also by his plenary portions, 
alive in the heart of every living entity as the Paramatma or Super Soul. Only saintly persons who, see, who can see within and without the Supreme Lord can actually attain perfect and eternal peace. And here we have also some words which seem to come from the Rig Veda Vishnu Paramam Padam. Uh, must maybe also this is also coming from the Upanishad. Let's see, verse uh, 165. Uh, Unto those devotees who constantly worship Lord Vishnu in the form of this yantra. Hmm. I don't see the word yantra in the Sanskrit, but anyway, it's there in the, in the, in the form of this yantra. Without any desire for personal sense gratification, Krish, Lord Hari, the Supreme Brahman, Sri Krishna, personally manifests before them after the completion of their worship. It's like a palashruti or a benediction on the person who performs this particular worship with this uh, five five word, 18 syllable Gopal mantra. Uh, and uh, there may be a yantra, which is a, a, a mystical design, um, which goes along with it, um, that that person will have Krishna will, uh, will personally manifest before them at the end of the worship, which is also what is stated in uh, Ram Tapani Upanishad and Narasimha Tapani Upanishad. For instance, there are, um, there's a Pratyangira mantra in uh, Narasimha Tapani Upanishad that if you chant, the benediction is, that the Lord will appear personally before you. So in the beginning of creation, the Supreme Lord, this is uh, text 166, first created Brahma. Sri Krishna then assumed various forms such as Matsya and, or, and Hayagriva to deliver the Vedas, right? So if we remember the Matsya incarnation um, saved the Vedas. The, for, there was a big inundation and, uh, and there was a big flood and the Vedas were saved by the Matsya, Matsya avatar. And then also Hayagriva, there were two demons called Madhu and Kaitapa who stole away the Vedas from Lord Brahma and the Hayagriva uh, incarnation came and killed those demons and returned the Vedas to Lord Brahma. So this all happened in the beginning of creation, which were submerged within the water of annihilation. The Lord then instructed the Vedas to Brahma. Every person who desires liberation should take shelter of the self-manifest Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna. So, uh, it says here in uh, verse 167, the 18-syllable mantra is the origin of all other mantras. Is the origin of all other mantras. So, uh, some people, when they when they they quote this, they they say, therefore, if you are initiated into the 18-syllable mantra, if it's the origin of all other mantras, if it's the greatest of all other mantras. That means that you have, you are, if you are initiated into this mantra, therefore you can use other mantras as well, even if you're not initiated into them, because it's the origin of all the mantras, and therefore you can consider yourself to be initiated into all mantras. Some people say like that. So, uh, of course, normally people will get initiated into any mantra that they actually use. But at the same time, if there's a mantra that has to be used, I, I know particularly in, in, in Gaudiya Vaishnavism, um, many people are not initiated into certain mantras, uh, and, but still they have to worship different deities like Nityananda or Radha, or they're not initiated in, into a Radha mantra or Nityananda mantra specifically by their guru or in their guru prampara, but still because they're initiated into the Gopal mantra, the idea is that they can, they can use those other mantras as well. So the 18 syllable mantra is the origin of all other mantras. Lord Krishna reveals himself to the devotee who chants this five word, Klim, Krishnaya, Govindaya, Gopijana, Vallabhaya, Swaha. Five word, 18 syllable Gopal, Govinda mantra, which begins and ends with Om. So here it says, Om Karenantaraitam, Ye Japanti. So it's specifically suggesting here that one should chant the Gopal Mantra beginning and ending with Om. So one should say Om, Krim Krishnaya Govindaya Gopijana Balabhaya Swaha Om, like that. So sometimes this is also um, discussed in Mantra Shastra. Sometimes there are different Bija Mantras which we start a mantra with, 
and those, those can be changed according to the purpose of chanting the mantra. And so here, this particular uh, sloka here is recommending that people should chant the Gopal Mantra starting with Om and ending with Om and the 18 syllables in between. So, but of course, uh, you're going to take, uh, every guru is going to give um, instruction to his disciples about how that particular disciple or all of his disciples, depending on the guru, he's going to give specific instructions on how to chant the mantra or how to use the mantra or what the meaning of the mantra is. So that's, that's left up to the, the guru. But at the same time here, in Haribhakti Vilas is a quotation that says, chant the, chant one should, one can chant the Gopal Mantra with beginning and ending with Om. Persons who desire liberation from material existence and eternal peace should always chant this Govinda Mantra. So that's just one way of chanting it. I don't know if there's anything more said about that in the purport. If we look at, at uh, if we look at verse 167, if we see if there's any, if there's any, uh, anything in the purport about that in the, in the commentary. So I don't see any, any specific commentary about that. Okay, we could look some of the time, but I don't, I don't, as a quick look, I didn't see anything specifically about that. Okay. So anyway, continuing on, text 168, mantras such as the 10 syllable mantra became manifested to the sages headed by Sanak. Later on, these mantras were practiced by the demigods headed by Indra who desire opulence as well as sages headed by Sanaka, who desire liberation and devotees headed by Narada, who desire devotional service. So let's have a look at that. So we have a 10 syllable mantra. The 10 syllable mantra usually of Gopal is, is said to be Klim Gopi Jana Vallabhaya Swaha. So instead of Krishnaya Govindaya, they take out the Krishnaya Govindaya from the 18th syllable. Krishnaya Govindaya. That's six. If you take hmm, Krishnaya Govindaya. Klim, Klim, Gopi Jana Vallabhaya Swaha. Oh, Gopi Jana Vallabhaya Swaha. Without the Klim, it's 10. Gopi Jana Vallabhaya Swaha. Yes, 10. Okay. So without the Klim, it's uh, Govinda, uh, Gopi Jana Vallabhaya Swaha. That's normally the 10 syllable Gopal Mantra is considered. There is a story that I've heard um, and we'd have to find out um, more, uh, more, more uh, proof about this. They say that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was actually initiated by Ishwara Puri uh, in the 10 syllable mantra, the 10 syllable Gopal Mantra. Anyway, so here it says mantras such as the 10 syllable mantra became manifest to the sages headed by Sanaka. Later on, these mantras were practiced by demigods headed by Indra to de who desire opulence. So the 10 syllable mantra, uh, there were 10, 10 syllable mantra practiced by the demigods to get opulence by the sages, like the four Kumaras to get liberation and by devotees like Narada Muni to get devotional service. And if we look in the Sanskrit, maybe we can see um, maybe we could, we cannot actually see, can't see exactly what the mantra is, but if you look in the, let's see, maybe it's in the, in the commentary here in Haribakti Vilas. And it also says here, Panchapati. So I guess, uh, 10 syllable mantra in five parts. I don't really understand that Panchapati. Hmm. Anyway. Normally, it's supposed to be Gopi Jana Vallabhaya Swaha. So we'll, we'll, we'll see. Maybe we can find out something more about that. Um, text 169. This is also stated in that Upanishad, meaning Gopatapani Upanishad. Brahma then said, During the first half of my life, I meditated upon and offered prayers to the Supreme Lord. At the end of the second half of my life, at the end of my night, the Supreme Lord assumed the form of a cowherd boy woke up from his yoga nidra and appeared before him. Excuse me, appeared before me, appeared before me. When the Supreme Lord appeared before me, I offered my obeisances at his lotus feet, 
with love and devotion. At that time, the Lord imparted to me the 18 syllable mantra that is non different from Him to empower me to create. After telling me this mantra, the Supreme Lord disappeared. So that's interesting, okay? Because Brahma here is saying that that a whole, at, at the end of the second half of, of his life, at the end of, of his night, okay, so we know that Brahma, Brahma does different, create, he creates things, right? And uh, so, but, but, but it's funny because uh, initially we understood, normally we understand that this mantra was given to the Lord, was given to Brahma at, at a certain time, um, maybe at the time of his birth or when he was very young. But here, Brahma specifically saying in Gopalthapani Upanishad that, that he got this mantra. He got this mantra at the end of, at the end of the second half of his life. So usually the first time, usually Brahma is considered to live for a hundred years of his time. And, and so we are actually uh, in the second half of his life, but we're not at the end of the second half of his life. So the, so the Gopatmani Upanishad is talking about a time when there was a Brahma and at the second half of his life, at the end of a night, at one night, right? When we know that when the, when, when the day comes, there's another um, creation, there's a small creation. And every night of Brahma, there's a, a small dissolution or um, uh, destruction of, of, uh, of the universe in a certain way. Not a, not a big pralaya, but a small one. So he says that the Lord appeared to him at that time and gave him this 18 syllable mantra, which is non different from him to empower him to create again the next day. After telling me this mantra, the Supreme Lord disappeared. Thereafter, when I desired to take up the work of creation, he again manifested before me in the form of a cowherd boy and displayed to me the would be universe within the would be universe within the 18 syllable mantra. So the Lord again afterwards um, appeared to Brahma and showed him the mantra and showed him that the universe is actually within the mantra. So the mantra is also non-different from the universe in some way. Thereafter, I created water from the letter Ka in the, in the, in the, uh, in the syllable Klim. Earth from the, from, the, from the letter La. Fire from the letter E. It must be E, long I, E. And moon from the Bindu, which is the Anushwara, the M. So Klim... From Klim, he created earth. Oh, sorry, from Klim, he created water, earth, fire, and moon. I then created the sun from, from Klim, from the full syllable Klim. Then I created the sky from the word Krishnaya, air from the word Govindaya, and the Surabi cow and the 14 types of knowledge from Gopijana and Balabaya, respectively. Now, there's going to be some more esoteric and deeper understanding of this. Um, to, to do, you probably have to read a commentary on Gopal Tapani Upanishad to understand exactly how this, this, um, this idea syncs with the idea of the Sankhya form of creation. So in Sankhya philosophy, the Vaishnava systems of philosophy, the different Vaishnava uh, Sampradayas, they follow, they accept the Sankhya system of philosophy uh, as far as the creation of different elements in the, in the, and how that, that came about. And we can see that in the Puranas like Shrema Bhagavatam where it describes creation. It goes according to the Sankhya system. There are two Sankhya systems. One is called Nirshara Sankhya and one is called Saishra Sankhya. So the Vaishnavas accept the Saishra Sankhya, which means we accept that the Lord, the Supreme Personality of Godhead or God created the universe and he created it in a certain way. There are, there's another, there was also another person, an atheist called, also called Kapila, who also preached the Nirishwara Sankhya, which is uh, the idea that, that matter just evolved by itself and there was no God. So we follow the one that where God created the universe from, from different forms of matter uh, and the different forms of matter and, and things. So in, in order, so this is, this would have, have some relationship to the Sankhya system of creation. 
So the idea is after Brahma saying here in the Upanishad that Krishna appeared to him and showed him the universe is actually within the Gopal Mantra or is non different from the Gopal Mantra. So therefore, what parts of the Gopal Mantra represent the different elements in the, in the process of creation is now being described. Okay. So after that, I created all the moving and non-moving beings, including men, women, and those that are neuter, right? So males, females, and those that are neuter. In this way, I completed the, the work of creation. Okay. So now leaving the Gopatapani Upanishad, text 170 and 171, talk about the Gautamiya Tantra again. From the Gautamiya Tantra, it's going to be explained a little bit more in detail about the different aspects of the Gopal Mantra. So Brahma created the universe from the sacred syllable orb. That's considered to be a, the seed, just like we have these seed mantras. Kliyam is also a seed. It's called Karma seed, Karma Dev seed. Um, so it's from the syllable Om. Brahma created the universe. So uh, this is described in the Shruti Shira Upanishad. The earth was produced from the syllable La. Water was produced from the syllable Ka. So we already heard that before. Ka is, uh, is water and La is um is uh is earth right and we and also there are pancha Upanishad mantras in pancharatra which identify different syllables with different elements so for instance lamprati vyatmani uh gandam samarpayami right uh this is pancha puja and and uh, uh and it and and it describes that the the scent which comes from the earth right uh, it has to do with the syllable la. So la uh, represents earth. Ka represents is produced uh, uh, produces water. Fire was produced from the syllable e, the long i in clean, right? Air was produced from the sound, the the anushwar, I believe. Oh no, uh, from sound air. What does it say up here? Vayu nada. Nada means sound. Okay. Sound and sky produced from the bindu. The bindu is the dot which represents the anushwara or the M in Klim. So bindu and nada are both parts of anushwara, I believe. So, so bindu and nada, so air and sky are produced from the anushwara in Klim. But here they've separated out bindu and nada into two different things, the sound and the and the uh, and the and the anushwara. So uh, that is why this mantra is said to be the origin of the five elements. Okay, so we have these five elements. So we have earth, water, fire, air, right? Air and ether, right? Sky, sky is ether, right? So this is why the, this mantra is said to be the origin of the five elements. It's actually the clean Bij itself is the origin of the five elements, the five gross elements or uh, stula bhutas. From uh, swa of swaha appeared the, the, the spirit soul or the jiva and the super soul. Hmm. So swa means oneself. So it means self. So swa of swaha comes the self or the atman, the jiva and the super soul and so the, there's a soul there's the individual soul and the super soul there's the atman and the paramatman and from ha of the swa swa swaha is cut up into two and is is swa and ha so the, from the ha appeared the spiritual potency what does it say in the sanskrit spiritual potency swa sabdena Sachetra gyo means the right. Heti chit prakriti para. Okay. Again, we need a commentary to explain exactly, understand exactly all of these, the significance of the different uh, words in the Gopal Mantra. But it seems to be uh, very simply being put here that the soul and the super soul come from the words, the, the syllable swa. And from ha comes spiritual potency, right? Spiritual potency or energy. 
By the combination of both the material and spiritual potencies, the creation takes place. The creation is finally dissolved into swaha. Dissolved into swaha. Hmm. So it's saying here, laya. Laya means dissolution. Swa-anike. Swarnake. Bhavet. Hmm. In the same literature, right? In the Shruti. So that was uh, Gautamiya Tantra. And now we're going back to some part of the Shruti. We don't know exactly. Probably Gopal Tapani Upanishad again. Uh, in, in verse 172, it is said, By chanting this mantra, King Chandra Dwaja attained knowledge of the self so that his illusion was dispelled. He chanted the 18-syllable mantra beginning with Om. As a result, he was able to give up his contact with matter and achieve the supreme abode of Lord Vishnu. Considering this, everyone should chant this mantra daily. Okay, so... Again, talking about chanting the 18 syllable mantra beginning with Om. Okay, so continuing on, verse uh, 173 and 174, the following verse is found in the same literature. Hmm. So, probably the literature above was again, it says Shruti. So, probably Gopaltapani Upanishad again. We'd have to look up these verses and see if they're all there in Gopaltapani Upanishad. But these two verses speak about the first word in this mantra came from the first word in this mantra came the earth from the second word came water from the third word came fire from the fourth word came air and from the fifth word came sky or ether simply by chanting this mantra king chandra dwaja attained the eternal abode of lord vishnu Okay, so here he's talking about the words, not the syllables. Um, padded, padded, hmm. from the pada, from the word, right? Yasya purva padded, bhumir, kritiyat, shalilod, shalilod bhavaha, kritiyat, teja, you say so, earth, water, fire, and smell here. Gandavahana, earth, uh, Chaturtad, Ganda, in the air, must be the air, Panchavan. Okay. So, text 175 <clears throat> The abode of Goloka, which possesses a form of pure goodness, which is uncontaminated, which is free from the influence of the modes of passion and ignorance, which is free from lamentation, and which is devoid of the influence of greed and illusion is non-different from the five-word mantra. This mantra is non-different from Lord Vasudeva. So not only is the material world non-different from this, this mantra, Gopal mantra, but also Goloka Vrindavan is non-different from Go this, this, which we see is there in uh, Brahma Samhita, describes the spiritual world of Goloka Vrindavan as, as being, uh, actually being hexagonal. Sometimes, Sometimes the Gopal Mantra is considered six-sided and sometimes five-sided. So we have Klim, Krishnaya, Govindaya, Gopijana, Vallabhaya, Swaha. So sometimes the Gopijana, Vallabhaya is split in two. And we have Klim, Krishnaya, Govindaya, Gopijana, Vallabhaya, Swaha, making six. And sometimes we see that it's divided only into five. Here it's divided into five. And the spiritual world and even Lord Krishna himself is considered non-different from the mantra. So it's interesting, later on, we're going to get a nyasa of uh, using Gopal Mantra, and it's going, there's going to be two nyasas given. There's going to be a nyasa given where the mantra is divided into five, and there's another nyasa, with another optional nyasa, where it's divided into six. So it seems to be an option that the, the mantra can be divided into five or into six. Here it's mentioned that it's divided into five, that it's non-different from the material world, non-different from the spiritual world, and also non-different from the Supreme Personality of God, Lord Vasudeva. So, text 176 continues on. The Supreme Lord Govinda, who is full of, who is eternal, full of knowledge and full of bliss, resides under a desire tree in Vrindavan, which manifests from the five-word mantra. So the, the Goloka Vrindavan manifests from the five-word mantra, and the desire tree, I guess, in, 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 in that place also manifests from the five-word mantra. 
I, along with the Murats, constantly worship him by meditating on his transcendental form. And we're guessing that this is Brahma speaking, saying that. So, text 177, the following passage is found in the same, in the same literature, also in the same literature. Anyone who chants the 18 syllable mantra easily attains the transcendental abode of the Supreme Lord. Although the Lord is present in one place, he is faster than the mind. The demigods cannot reach him because he is beginningless and the origin of all. Text 178. Therefore, Sri Krishna alone is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. One should meditate on him, chant his glories, worship him, and serve him with love and devotion. He is the Supreme Brahman and the Absolute Truth. Text 179 to 181. From the Trilokya Sam Samohan Tantra, uh, Lord Shiva instructed Durga about the 18 syllable mantra. Now, later on, we're going to, when we learn about the these different forms of nyasa for the Gopal Mantra, there's going to be one where uh, Durga is actually um, the seer of this particular mantra. So, um, text 179 to 181 states, there are thousands of incarnations of Lord Krishna. There are, there are thousands of incarnations of Lord Krishna. They are all controllers of the universes and are capable of awarding the four objectives of life, religiosity, economic development, <clears throat> sense gratification and liberation. So that's Dharma, Artha, Karma, and Moksha. The childhood pastimes of the incarnations are rarely discussed. Lord Krishna enacted many wonderful pastimes as a child. In these pastimes, he sometimes displayed mercy and sometimes awarded punishment. Now I shall disclose to you the great mantra of Lord Krishna as a child. So, so what he's saying here is that there are many incarnations of the Lord. So there's we've discussed some of the incarnations, Narasimha and uh, Rama. There's many different incarnations, right? And they all had pastimes as ch uh, ch childhood pastimes. Well, maybe ex an exception could be uh, Lord Narasimha because he didn't really have a childhood. He just appeared very quickly. But... Um, Anyway, he's saying here in this mantra that uh, the Lord has, the Lord in his different incarnations has childhood pastimes, but really we don't know of the childhood pastimes of some of the other incarnations, but we know specifically about the childhood pastimes of Lord Krishna, in which he awarded mercy, displayed mercy and awarded punishment to different personalities. And so now, because we're talking about child Krishna, Krishna as a child, a young child, so Shiva is going to explain a mantra to Devi, to Durga, right? A, 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 for child Krishna. This may be the same mantra, the Gopal mantra, probably will be the same mantra. The idea is the Gopal mantra is, is, a, is a mantra of Krishna, Lord Krishna as a child. So one who understands the glories of this mantra understands everything. If a person chants this mantra, with a desire to receive a son or some wealth, his desire will certainly be fulfilled. So there it is. Even if you chant this mantra with a uh, Gopal mantra with uh, some material desire, like to get wealth or to uh, to have a son, you can still, you can still, uh, there is also another mantra, Gopal mantra, Sanatan Gopal mantra, which is used by people who want to have progeny, who, who, who don't have children and, and couples that want to bear children. But that's not, what's being spoken of here is the Gopal Mantra itself is being spoken of. So continuing on with text 183, there is no doubt that one who chants this mantra will become a learned scholar of the scriptures. He can come to control the three worlds and thus make the entire world shiver in fear of him. Text 184, such a person can enchant everyone and destroy all of his enemies. What more? The chanter of this mantra certainly attains liberation. So that's interesting. So they have these uh, things that you can enchant someone or you can destroy your enemies. These are normally, in Narada Pancharatra, it describes that using the Gopal Mantra in, in different ways, chanting in different ways, you can do, use it to destroy enemies and also to enchant people. So this enchanting people means putting them in, in hypnosis or just having them come under your control is normally in Mantra Shastra called Vasikarnam. So Vasikarnam is not, not usually something which is, which is uh, practiced by 
Vaishnavas, but but uh, is practiced very much these destroying enemies and, and enchanting people is practiced very much in black tantra. But in white tantra or in, in, in the Vaishnava tantra, it's not normally done. But in Narada Pancharatra, there are some some descriptions of how to use the Gopal Mantra to do these things to uh, to attract women and attract wealth and attract um, uh, and to destroy enemies and things. But you have to chant it in different ways. So that's beyond the, the purview of Hari Bhakti Vilas. Unless people want to go into that, we could look at Narada Pancharatra, we could explain that also. But that's there. Okay, so then continuing on uh, verses 185-186, as a touchstone, a touchstone usually means a stone which you can touch the things and it turns those things into gold or it gives, just like the tree and the cow, it might give all desires. It might, it might be something that fulfills your desires. As a touchstone is the best amongst all jewels, as a cow is the best amongst all animals, as a chaste wife is the best amongst all ladies, as a Brahmin is the best amongst all human beings. As the Ganges is the best amongst all rivers, the 18 syllable mantra is the best among all mantras. So we're still talking about the 18 syllable mantra, although we did at a certain point talk about the 10 syllable Gopal mantra, but we're now talking about, again, continuing to talk about the 18 syllable mantra and it's the best of all mantras. As Vaishnava literature is the best of all literatures, as eloquent words are the best of all words, this mantra is the best of all of all mantras, the best of all mantras. Continuing on to text 187, and he's further said, Lord Shiva is again talking to Devi in this Samohan Tantra, I believe, Samohan Tantra, right? Yeah, Trilokya Samohan Tantra, right? This is a Tantra. And a lot of arguments and Tantras are spoken by Lord Shiva to, to Devi, to Parvati. Um, There is no doubt that he who chants this mantra will become a learned scholar of the scriptures. Yeah, we did that. He can come under the control of the three. He can come to control the three worlds and make the entire world shiver in fear of him. Such a person can enchant everyone and destroy all his enemies. What more the chanter of this mantra certainly attains liberation. As a touchstone, it's the best of jewels. Yes, we continue on. It's the best of mantras. Oh, goddess, Lord Shiva continues. This is why I chant this mantra every day. So here we have further, um, further explanation that Lord Shiva even chants this. Shiva is considered to be the greatest Vaishnava Maha Sambhu. So Samba, Samba, uh, Sambhu or Shiva is considered to be the greatest Vaishnava. He's uh, all, always worshiping Lord Rama or also always worshiping Lord Krishna. So he's saying here to Parvati that he chants the Gopal mantra every day. There is no mantra within the world of moving or non-moving entities as equal to it. So even Shiva chants it. So now continuing on from a book called the Sanat Kumar Kalpa. It is also mentioned in uh, text 188 to 190. Um, some more things about Gopal Mantra. These, there are 33 classes of mantras. Okay, so we don't exactly know what they are in relation to Lord Gopal, Krishna, but this is the king of all mantras. O oh, best of the sages, in the Samohan Tantra, this mantra has been described as Suprasanna, or the most blissful mantra. You should keep this mantra secret. During the reign of the present Manu, Purandara had attained the post of Indra by chanting this mantra. He had received the mantra from Lord Vishnu and, become, and then become the ruler of the heavenly planets. So continuing on, text 190. Long ago, Indra lost all good fortune as a result of being cursed by the great, great sage Durvasa. And yet, on the strength of chanting this king of mantras, he regained his good fortune. Well, text 192. What more can I say about this? Without performing any rituals before reciting this mantra, if one simply chants it, he will obtain all desired results. And now here again, with the Gopal Mantra, it said, Vinapi, uh, Vina, Puras Charna Sadhana. Without Puras Charna, one can receive, can receive the desired results without Puras Charna. Okay, so 
Text 193. I offer my respectful obeisances at the lotus feet of Sri Krishna Chaitanya. So here we have Gopabada inserting a verse written by himself. Uh, I offer my respectful obeisances to the lotus feet of Sri Krishna Chaitanya, who is the spiritual master of my spiritual master. Hmm. It's interesting that Gopabada would say that, his spiritual master of his spiritual master. He, can, he must consider somebody else to be his spiritual master. Simply by taking shelter of his lotus feet, even momentarily, a neophyte devotee can become an exalted devotee. So now he's going to change the subject a little bit. And the next, uh, the next uh, subject is text 194, the qualities of a candidate eligible for chanting this mantra. You, you can see the emphasis that they put on the glories of the Gopal mantra here in the Hari Bhakti Vilas over and, over and above the, the other mantras, the other Vaishnava mantras, which are also mentioned. That's because they're going to use throughout Hari Bhakti Vilas, they're going to use that mantra for, for for the food worship of the deity for, for many different things. Obviously there's more, you know, there's more esoteric understanding of the, the Gopal Tapani Upanishad is obviously has some deep, deeper, deeper meanings about the different, the different mantras and different syllables in the mantra and, and what it means. And the exact, I was sort of surprised. The one thing I was surprised was that when in the Upanishad, it says that, that, uh, that Krishna is, or the Lord instructed this mantra to Brahma, but only in the last half of his life or at the end of his life. It's sort of um, was strange for me to, to hear that from Gopatapani Upanishad. Maybe we could look at Gopatapani Upanishad and see what it exactly says. I have, we have two copies. We have one which was published by um, Kriparari Swami um, on, on the basis of some North Indian, the North Indian text version of it, uh, translated by Jagadananda. And the other one I have is uh, in the, which comes from the Ajahn Library, which is a critical edition from the manuscripts in South India. So I have both, and uh, we could look at we could look at them also to get more insight in Gopal Tapani Upanishad and exactly what it says. <laughs> 